could very well be a, a molecular weight difference occurring here, that something in the use environment of that sample is causing the change to break down, and therefore it's leading to the failures that we're seeing. Now, another case study deals with splints that were, are used for broken bones. Um, PSI had been involved in a previous project for this particular client, um, helping them to, to determine an appropriate recipe for their splints. Um, this included some thermoplastic polymer, some rubber, as well as some inorganic filler. So they took that recipe and started to manufacture the splints, but they were seeing some variations in how they behaved. The setting time was different, the stiffness was different in some cases, um, and they needed to figure out why that was happening because the end users weren't happy with those variations. Now they suspected that their compounder was varying that recipe and they wanted to have some ammunition um, to go to the compounder with and get this um, situation taken care of. So again, we applied our favorite technique of DSC. On the left is the good sample, on the right is the bad. And we see again, the area of that melting peak is, is quite different between the two samples. It's a good sample showing more crystallinity than the bad. Um, and the way these splints were used, they were heated uh, and then formed. So the crystallinity could be affecting um, how the stiffness of the sample at the particular temperatures they were heating at. You might expect that with this lower crystallinity in the bad sample, it may be a little bit um, too um, flimsy for their application, and that was indeed what they were seeing in some cases. Um, because this was mineral field, we ran TGA as well. A good sample on the right showed about 20% filler, while that on the left had about only about 13%. So pretty, pretty dramatic difference there. So um, between showing that there were different, there was different crystallinity and that the filler levels were different, we then had um, the conclusion that there were indeed different recipes being used, and our customer was then able to go back to his compounder and uh, get some solution to this problem so that they could um, make better splints in the future. So to summarize, um, we've talked about how polymers can exhibit various temperature-dependent phenomena. Um, hopefully I've given you a flavor of, of how thermal analysis works and how you may be able to use it in your situation. Um, it can help us to probe the different transitions that are present in polymers. Um, but as we've been saying all along here, all these results are typically heating rate dependent, so that's something to be aware of, uh, again, when you're comparing data from various sources or um, even if you're, you're looking at your particular application, um, choosing the heating rate might be key to that. So I would like to give a special thanks to the Thermal Group here at Polymer Solutions. Uh, Suzanne's our lead in that group and Mariah and Sam are the technicians. And they do a really great job of developing new methods to meet our customers' needs and getting things done in very quick fashion. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention, and um, I'll answer any questions you might have. Great. If we have any questions at this time, please press star 8 on your telephone. And while we're waiting for questions, I'll just remind everyone that if you'd like to download, a, download the PDF of the presentation, you may do so by pressing the Handouts button at the top of the screen. And that icon appears as three white sheets of paper. So once again, if we have any questions, please press star 8 on your telephone. Okay, I'll move our first question into conference. Hi, thanks for uh, the presentation. I'm just wondering, did you have a, a solution? For your broken compares? Um, through some of the other tests that we did, we had a pretty good idea of what was occurring. Um, um, it basically was a, an interaction of the use conditions, um, some of the materials that were being produced there with the, the material that the conveyor belt was made out of, and that was leading to the failures. So, sorry, I can't be more specific. Did you add? Did you recommend that they change the conveyors after a time, or was there a kind of a, a, a visual warning based on, on what, what your testing did to recommend a, 
a frequency of change of the conveyors or anything like that? Um, we didn't make any specific recommendations like that. In this case, probably it would be recommended to use a different material for the conveyors. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, great. I'll move our next question in. Yes, hello. I um, have an application where I need to measure thermal and electrical conductivity of some polymers. I was wondering what techniques you'd recommend. Well, it depends a bit on what temperature um, is of interest in that case and the form of your sample and so forth. Uh, as I mentioned, we can do some thermal conductivity using modulated DSC, but it is somewhat limited in the form of the sample and the temperatures that we can test. I think there are some other um, methods, a guarded hot plate apparatus perhaps, that can do a lot wider temperature range. Um, the electrical conductivity um, is a totally different area. Um, there are dielectric thermal analyzers out there um, that can do that kind of testing as well. But at the moment, I'm not even sure who makes those at this point in time. I know one company used to, and I don't believe they do any longer. Okay. Um, what temperature ranges uh, with this, uh, where the M uh, NDSC can, can work? We typically run against a polystyrene standard, and the test involves having your sample sit directly on the stage in the instrument. So you have to stay under the glass transition of the polystyrene. So the, the maximum temperature is usually 80 to 90, and it also has to be that your sample is a solid at that temperature as well. Okay. That would work fine. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, great. Do we have any other questions? If so, please press star 8 on your telephone. Okay, I'll move our next question in. Yes, I have a question. What would you recommend for temperature-dependent viscosity measurements on polymers? Um, what we would typically do would be melt rheology for that. Uh, we have an instrument where we can do parallel plate as well as cone and plate um, and access frequencies from very low, something 0.001 hertz up to 100 hertz uh, in a very broad temperature range. Um, so kind of depending on what kind of information you're after, that would be the instrument that we would recommend and we could set up a specific test plan based on your needs. And that can get uh, the measurements from uh, glass transition all the way up through melt and beyond? Well, we can use the instrument to do solids testing, but basically you would need to do two different tests. Um, you can do either a melt test or solids test. There's really nothing that, that encompasses the whole range in between. But we've done some things where we can, we can get close to filling in the gap between them um, by doing a combination of the tests. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. We do have time for more questions. Okay, we have another one. Hello, this is Natalie Merrill with Honeywell, and I'm also interested in the thermal conductivity of polymer samples. Uh -huh. I did have one which was solid at 80 to 90 degrees centigrade. Uh -huh. What kind of um, units or what kind of results can we get out for the thermal conductivity versus polystyrene control? Um, so basically, you get um, the thermal conductivity of your sample. We just use the, the polystyrene to calibrate based on. Um, so, watts per gram Kelvin, I think, is the unit. Mm -hmm. um, so, we're actually measuring that directly. We have uh, a thin sample, which is less than 0.4 millimeters and we measure that against a thicker sample, which is three to four millimeters thick, and the instrument um, basically is measuring the lag in the large sample versus a thin sample, and that can allow us to determine thermal conductivity. Thank you. If it's possible, I'd like to know um, who else asked the question in case there's a, a subset of us who are pursuing that area and, and learning about the analysis. Um, I don't have any way to determine who asked the question. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, they can contact me. Okay. Natalie Merrill at Honeywell. Maybe I don't know how I can find out who they are either. But thank you. 
Okay. Our next question is. Uh, yes, it's Jim Vanderby from uh, Molly. I'm the, I have a question regarding.